So let's get started. This is going to be a joint presentation from Anahita and, and Frank. Anahita is a counseling psychologist who provides psychological consultation, assessment, and therapy to organizations, individuals, and couples. Her areas of interest include space psychology, higher states of consciousness, well-being, performance, neuropsychology, and trauma. She lectures nationally and internationally and, and has presented her ideas about the overview effect and mental health on BBC Radio 4, Central St. Martins, UCL, and TEDx. Anahita researched the, th the therapeutic value of the overview effect as part of her doctoral studies. After completing her studies, she founded VR Overview Effect, the first tech-based multi-sensory company that designs and researches treatments based on the self-transcendent experience of the overview effect. Anahita has also designed the, the first brief focus therapy that combines virtual reality and the overview effect with ecotherapy. You can learn more about her work at www.vr-overview-effect.co.uk or follow VROE on Instagram at VR underscore overview effect uh, or on Twitter at Dr. Anahita. So the first speaker today is actually going to be Frank and Frank is a space philosopher who has authored numerous books on topics ranging from space exploration, climate change and artificial intelligence. His best known work, The Overview Effect, Space Exploration and Human Evolution, is considered by many to be a seminal work in the field of, in the field of space exploration. A film called Overview, based largely on his work, has had nearly 8 million plays on Vimeo. Since his book was published in 1987, The Overview Effect has become a standard term for describing the, sp the spaceflight experience. The fourth edition, including original interviews with 31 astronauts, was published earlier this year. You can learn more about Frank's work at www.frankwhiteauthor.com. So without further ado, let's get started with, with this talk. I'm really excited about this. And thank you to everybody for, for being here and tuning in. Okay, Niall, thank you so much. And thanks to everyone who's here. I have to let you know it's five o'clock in the morning in the United States. And uh, I'm feeling a bit of self-transcendence myself at this point. Uh, my body says you should be asleep. My mind says, no, you need to make a presentation. So that's what I'm going to do. And just bear with me. Uh, I'm, I'm sure we will get through it OK. Um, so the overview effect and self-transcendence, what, what is that all about? Well. I think we always have to start with a definition of the overview effect, which is a term I coined after an experience I had on an airplane uh, many years ago in the 1980s. And it's come to be actually multi-layered uh, four different components at least. It is important to understand it as experiential. That is to say, any data that I have is about experiences that astronauts have reported uh, when they have seen the Earth from space and in space. By from space, I mean in low Earth orbit. Uh, by in space, I mean that they have seen the Earth from a lunar mission like the picture that's shown here is from Apollo 17 on their return from the moon. So the difference is that either the Earth fills your vision or the universe fills your vision. And when you're on the moon, for example, you're much, much farther away than when you're in orbit. So you really see the, the whole Earth and uh, you see it against the background of the cosmos. Uh, it's also become an idea about space flight, and that is to say it's moved from simply being an experience to being a concept. It's also a theory about the impact of space flight on human consciousness, and that's important in the sense that there's a hypothesis about this experience, and then there's data. That's what a theory is, as I'm sure you know. 
And the data is really, uh, for me, self-reporting by people who've been out there, <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, who've seen the Earth from a distance. Finally, a new idea that I've recently been informed about is that it's a boundary object. And I'll talk more about each of these as we go along. And I'm hoping all of this will give you some preparation from, for listening to Anahita, of course. This is a iconic picture of astronaut Tracy Caldwell Dyson. She's in the cupola of the International Space Station and she's looking out at the planet below. So it's an experience and she's having it. It's a shift in awareness, if you will. It's a shift in identity. It's a shift in worldview. Identity because you begin to think about the whole of the earth rather than the individual parts. Worldview in that once you've made this transition, it's very difficult to see anything in the same way again. As I said, it happens when you see the Earth from space and in space. There are many aspects to the experience, but I think critical is that you see the Earth as a whole system. And the theory of the overview effect is a systems theory. And in relation to self-transcendence, you see yourself as part of a larger whole. It's an idea. This is a picture of Yuri Gagarin. Uh, I mean, it's a picture of a sculpture of Yuri Gagarin, the first human being to have this experience. And the idea of what spaceflight means, as President John F. Kennedy discussed, he said, we, we don't really understand the meaning of spaceflight. That idea has been developing since Gagarin's flight in 1961. It's an idea about spaceflight. It's an idea about the Earth. I've talked about the overview and the effect. The overview is that perception that you get when you're at a distance from the planet. Then there's an effect, and that effect can be individual or sociological, individual or an impact on society. And not all astronauts describe it in the same way because everybody is an individual and they have their own thinking and their own history, their own way of understanding any experience. And that would be true of you and me. If you went to, well, one example we use in the United States, if you went to the Grand Canyon, you would, you would probably have an experience of awe and wonder. Most people do but you're an individual and so what was meaningful to you might be different from what is meaningful to others there are some commonalities i've detected and anahita has detected in these reports people are struck by the fact that i knew there were no borders or boundaries on the planet like on a globe but i'm still I was still shocked when I saw that. I knew the atmosphere was thin, but from the surface it looks endless. I was really struck by how thin the atmosphere is, how fragile our existence seems. And I realized we're all in this together. No matter how different we are as human beings, our humanity and our, our existence here on this planet really means we're all in this together. Astronauts come back generally more environmentally aware, more humanitarian, more concerned about conflict on the surface. And there's a study at the University of British Columbia, a very rigorous study, which showed a significant shift in values from an individualistic to a more universalistic uh, set of values. I think that's terribly important. That's that's an indication we might have something here that we could use for the benefit of all. It's also a theory, and originally, when I had my experience on the airplane, 
quite honestly, I wasn't thinking about astronauts at all. I was thinking about space communities, people living off the planet and always seeing the earth in the sky, like this picture taken from the moon that may be a painting, but it represents what the earth looks like from the moon. And I had a hypothesis that these people would start <clears throat> at a very different level of consciousness from surface dwellers. In fact, their whole philosophy of life would be different. They would take for granted things we're actually struggling to understand, like our inherent interconnectedness. Well, there were no space people at the time. There still aren't. There's no one living permanently off the planet. And that's where I had the idea to interview astronauts. And this actually changed the hypothesis because we found out that for surface dwellers, i.e. astronauts, to leave the planet and look back, it was not ordinary, it was extraordinary, meaningful. And perhaps if we could bring this overview effect down to Earth, that awareness the astronauts tell us about, wouldn't it be salutary for mental health, conflict resolution, many different aspects of life on Spaceship Earth? The astronauts often compare life on Earth to life on the International Space Station, how people from many different nations and backgrounds work well together on the ISS, and wouldn't it be great if we really understood we are in space, we are always going to be in space, and we are moving through the universe on a natural spaceship called Earth. That's our spacecraft, and uh, it's a wonderful spacecraft. It's far more complex even than the International Space Station, and we need to take care of it. Uh, recently, a friend of mine named Fred Colopy told me he thought the overview effect is a boundary object, and I didn't know what that was. This is my definition. It's fairly close, I think, to the traditional definition, but we can think of a boundary object as information, a theory, even an artifact that has internal coherence but flexible enough to be used by many different communities. And two sociologists uh, published a paper in 1989 about this. Uh, and the idea was it came out of Starr's research where she sort of overturned the idea that different groups needed consensus to work together effectively. And she found that if they had a boundary object, they could work together without consensus. Um, I believe the overview effect fits the definition very well. If you do a Google search of the overview effect, you'll find so many references to it. If you look on YouTube and look for videos and films about the overview effect, you'll see many, I've lost count, People are working on this concept without a consensus. That is to say, without coming together and working together. Now, many of us are. Many of us are working together to bring the overview effect down to earth. It's a wide variety of people from therapists to artists to sociologists to organizational development uh, practitioners. So it's a boundary object. How is it relevant to self-transcendence and wellness? Well, I am not a psychotherapist, but what I know about psychotherapy, I think it's helpful to think of yourself as part of a larger whole system. Uh, to be able to transcend yourself and see how you fit into uh, a larger system that has purpose and direction. Psychotherapy, it seems to me, is an example, and I'm going to leave the details to Anahita, but I feel that a therapist tries to give clients an overview of their life, 
And that is to say, if you can get above the details of your life as astronauts get above the details of life on Earth, you begin to see that it hold, it holds together. There seems to be uh, rationale to your life. Things that seemed arbitrary and unpredictable perhaps fit into uh, some larger sense of your your life and your purpose in life and your relationship to others. And Anahita is a leader in this field with her work on VROE, virtual reality and the overview effect, which is a very important combination. So just to conclude, I love this picture of the child with the cardboard space helmet. More than one astronaut has told me that when they were a kid, that's how they got started. They had a cardboard spaceship, cardboard helmet and so on. I think we're at a moment of almost um, childlike, not childish, but childlike wonder and awe as we contemplate our Earth and its beauty and its, its wonderfulness, but also its place in the cosmos. And we are now developing ways to communicate the overview effect as an experience through, uh, for example, virtual reality, but also the opportunity to experience it directly <clears throat> is also opening up for the rest of us. And we want to ask the question, how will this affect individuals and society? Of course, mental health is a big issue worldwide. So anything we can do to improve individual mental health is going to be useful. Uh, it's the new normal where our relationship to the universe is becoming more apparent, our relationship to our own planet and our responsibility, our deep responsibility for planet Earth is becoming far more apparent. The question it raises, and Anahita will talk about this more, and when we get to the Q&A, we can talk about it more too. How can we use this powerful experience for the good of all? How can it be a positive evolutionary step for global society? That's a question I will leave with those of you who are here now that you know what the overview effect is. We need everybody to get involved. And I would like to welcome you to this dialogue and this conversation. Um, we all have a role to play and I hope that you will find it interesting enough and awesome enough uh, to get involved in the dialogue. So thank you very much. I'm going to turn it over to Anahita now. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm going to have to go through these slides pretty quick, um, but it's a, it's a pleasure to be here with you all. Um, and my name is Anahita Nazami. I'm a counseling psychologist. Um, and my uh, expertise area really is in the overview effect and um, increasingly space health. Um, so with astronaut and cosmonaut um, and trauma and depression. Now, I'm London based, but um, uh, I also present um, internationally um, at conferences. So today we're going to just really look at um, making a case for VR assisted self transcendent treatments based on the overview effect. Um, Frank has done a wonderful job in telling you what the overview effect is, so I'm not going to go over that too much, um, perhaps expanding on the definition that he's provided a bit later on. Um, so we're going to look at reconsidering and reframing mental health. Uh, we're going to have a summary of the doctoral research that um, I, I um, did back um, in two, or completed back in 2016. And we're going to really look at other bits of research relevant to um, self-transcendence and the overview effect. We're going to provide a bit of a broad description of um, virtual reality overview effect. We're going to rush through that a little bit. Um, and then we're going to have a summary of uh, our mission or VROE's mission and the milestones we've reached so far. So um, we're going to try to touch on some of the sort of um, 
the, the, the developing rationale and theoretical framework behind VROE tech and therapies and talk about how we're trying to do some citizen research as well as some uh, applied research to try to test our hypothesis and propositions and also to um, develop evidence-based therapies eventually. Um, that's what our goal is. So, um, so we'll start with the question that was posed um, for this conference. What do we mean when we say I? Of course, I um, is really this idea of self is about sort of the stories that we tell ourselves, but also about sort of the input that we receive from culture, from our parents, from schools, from society at large. And so we begin to develop this identity around that. And of course, one of the pioneers in sort of explaining the psyche and the self uh, was Sigmund Freud. And we're not going to go into sort of too heavily um, into his work, um, but he, he really conceptualized this sort of structure of the psyche. And he, he really looked into the dividing it into sort of these categories, these sort of um, separate distinct categories that are interrelated. And he talked about the id, the primitive part of the mind, and he talked about the superego, the sort of moral part of the mind, and he talked about the ego, which he kind of talked about the ego as this sort of agent that was um, really um, the mediator between the id and the superego. Um, and and as, as a result, the ego often gets into, you know, um, negative chatter, um, the ego often develops defenses to cope with um, this dialogue and this mediation role that it has, as well as the input coming in from the outside world. So in relation to the ego um, and identity and personality, well, what does that mean? And that's only really one aspect of who we are. Um, and of course, psychoanalysis um, um, really um, doesn't have that much evidence. And of course, people like Mark Solms are doing wonderful work in trying to provide um, some, some neuropsychological um, evidence um, to, to sort of support some of the concepts in, in, in psychoanalytical um, theory. Um, so the ego really is around sort of talking about um, this sort of aspect of us is which is the mediator but actually personalities and and identities is very complex and many psychologists over the years have really been trying to break down what it is um, and of course there there are many you know Einstein's um, three-factor model of personality Myers-Briggs five-factor models of personality um, and a, a more recent um, the Enneagram um, uh, personality uh, model which is a very recent one um, and um, this um, tri-dimensional tri model of personality by Cloninger et al. Um, in 1993 is actually one of the more recent um, models of personality. So we can't go into all of those models and theories of personality, but it's just showing you that, you know, identity and self and personality is a very complex area in uh, psychology. But this model of personality really breaks down the character and the temperament and looks at um, character in three dimensions, um, self-directedness, which is really about this sort of autonomous self, um, this, this side of us that kind of um, thinks of ourselves as independent from the world, and then this part or the side of the personality which um, sort of navigates the world from that perspective of, you know, autonomous being and um, self-directedness. And then there's this sort of second dimension, which is about cooperativeness. And really that dimension is about that sort of who we are in the social world and, and um, that sense of understanding that sort of connection with others, other social beings, with, with even sort of the, the world, um, in a sense, around us. Um, and then the third dimension is this sort of self-transcendent dimension, which really looks at this sort of extended connection to the universe and the cosmos and our place in it and feeling like a universal being and perhaps even losing a sense of time and space. And so he really accounted, or they really accounted for Cloninger et al, for these sort of different aspects of character and how we can actually, um, you know, have dominant sides of us. So we might you know, be more dominant in self-directedness, or perhaps we are more dominant in self-transcendence. Um, and he looked at mental health from that angle as well. So if we're, if we're 
overly dominant with you know being an autonomous self we're separate from the whole entire world and that's our dominant side how can that affect mental health or if we're completely self-transcendent and losing um you know this sort of um uh, relationship and um with space and time then how can that affect our mental health you know so he didn't sort of look at it as just you know good and bad sort of dichotomy he kind of really looked at it in terms of breaking it down into these sort of um areas um which which is very interesting and i um i do recommend that you all look at his work or their work and then of course there's a temperament side which is more those sort of inherited aspects of our personality and i'm not going to go too much into that side you can read it there on the screen but they're the kind of inherited aspects that we kind of um get from our you know ancestors and we get from our uh, immediate parents and our genetics and and all the rest of it but the part that's really relevant to what we're talking about today is, is to do with the character um uh, for today anyway for today's purpose so, of course, identity also has different and this idea of self goes through different developmental milestones. And you have, you know, early on in development where, you know, um, you know, you're you're probably the idea of self isn't fully formed yet. And you're you're uh, still developing this idea of self and, and object relations. And, you know, very early on, you, you're still feeling connected to you know, your mother. Um, and so this idea of self isn't fixed and it moves through these developmental milestones. And Eric Erickson, amongst other people, was one of the psychologists that sort of talked about this. And self in adolescence, for example, is, is when um, we're trying to um, really cement um, this idea of the individual self. Who am I? what's my identity and where do i belong in the world and so actually for example in relation to self-transcendence um there needs to be uh, it's not that self-transcendence isn't for young people but it really there needs to be that resilience and that idea of self uh, and that idea of individual self as distinct um from um uh, you know, from the world needs to be formed and is, is a healthy part of our development. So I'm an advocate for self-transcendence. I might not be sounding it right now. I am. But I'm also aware that, you know, these ideas and concepts and theories in psychology, you know, people need to understand them before we introduce these sort of self-transcendent interventions into mental health. Um, uh, that's very important. Again, I haven't got time to go into this, but you can look at Erickson's model, um, uh, developmental model, psychosocial developmental model. So we've looked very, very briefly and quickly into personality and identity and the complexities around sort of um, this idea of self and Freud's work and Erickson's work and, um, and other types of personality sort of scales. Um, and now we're looking into sort of, OK, so how does culture, um, you know, influence who we are, our sense of self? And of course, culture is a big area and there's different cultures in different countries that have even micro cultures within them. So I'm, I'm kind of looking at this sort of broader capitalist culture because we're in the West and um, there's different forms of capitalism. I'm not going to go into that. But if we think about extreme forms of capitalism um, and we think about how it's influencing our sense of self it's clear that you know capitalist um, ideology really looks at um, well i've written here churning people and nature into capital so really it's all about targets it's all about monetary gain and it's all about com um, somewhat aggressive competition at one uh, at times and so how can that sort of influence and how can that subliminal and direct message influence us and our character and who we think we are within the context of the world and i think uh, again i'm not against capitalism I, you know i'm actually you know in some ways i think the system has worked to a degree but is now needing to evolve but how can we look at that and think about how it's influencing our sense of self and for sure we'll find that it is influencing who we think we are and how we navigate the world so um, one of uh, Thomas More, who I admire, and he writes beautifully, a Jungian psychotherapist, former monk and a beautiful writer uh, who wrote Care of the Soul. 
um, he said that, you know, he foresaw that a culture that places excessive emphasis on individualism, ruthless competition and separation would slowly diminish core values associated with nature and human connectedness and intensify feelings of emptiness, meaninglessness uh, within people. And so what is what, some of the leading causes of uh, mental illness, which is on the rise, um, you know, uh, in the world, is isolation, loneliness, and meaninglessness. So um, he foresaw that the culture plays a big role, uh, you know, in in terms of mental illness, and so that that can be a problem. Um, and that that and we need to address it. We need to kind of talk about it openly because, you know, the medical model within. Um, psychotherapy and within uh, medicine, um, really, there was a period of time where it purported and stated that, you know, it's very much the, 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 the responsibility was on genetics. You know, if you're mentally ill, if there's something wrong with you, you know, there's, 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 there's a faulty gene, you've inherited it, there's something wrong with you. And actually now, um, people are realizing actually environment is really a big deal too. And it's not about faulty genes on and off, switching on and off necessarily. It's actually also about you know the cultural environment the family environment and how that influences mental health and so now the, the the focus is beginning to move or shift again back onto governments back onto schools back onto those microsystems within cultures and societies and and and, and that you know the, that the change happening from there as well so again, the problem going back to the ego and the defenses we developed to sort of um, cope with all of this stress within the world, you know, com aggressive competition, um, you know, targets to be met, constantly feeling like we're in the hamster's cage. We've developed defenses, as, you know, perhaps as part of the ego. And so, you know, we, the, some of the feelings and um, states that might arise might be jealousy or, you know, uh, greed even, wanting more and more because, you know, the locus of control is external. And we're constantly thinking about our next aim or target and the next thing we want, you know, more money, more, more, uh, you know, uh, bigger houses, bigger cars. So jealousy and greed could begin to sort of really take um, space in our internal world, um, uh, you know, needing to over control things and not being able to sort of tolerate uncertainty, which is a given of the universe. Um, or, or wanting to sort of over control and over analyze materialism, you know, um, intolerance, resentment, uh, ruthless competition, which is different to healthy competition, by the way. Healthy competition is advocated, but ruthless competition, aggressive competition can be unhealthy. Power and um, self importance, you know, again, our drive. So the culture is fueling the drive to, for power, um, you know, as opposed to fueling the drives for you know spirituality or self transcendence or meaning and purpose you know and um so it becomes a problem so um uh, we're going to just quickly look at sort of um hedonistic values and um eudonistic uh, or eudonistic values apologies and we're going to look at so 2500 or approximately 2500 years ago people like Plato talked about and many other philosophers talked about these um, in the differences between the, you know hedonistic values um, and hedonistic values so you know a person with a stronger hedonic orientation is motivated by feeling good and tends to pursue instant pleasure physical and emotional you know, that kind of hedonistic treadmill, higher levels of positive emotions and avoidance of pain and discomfort and hedonistic pursuits associated with greater immediate well-being. Well-being interventions that might utilize the hedonic perspective really just aim to decrease negative emotions and increase positive emotions. And of course, the field of po um, positive psychology, although looks at eudonistic um, aspects was heavily focused for a pe period on hedonistic um, uh, emotions and feelings. Now, a person with a stronger eudony eudonymic um, orientation is motivated by the pursuit of a good life and is more focused on flourishing in terms of character strengths and virtues. And eudonymic pursuits are associated with sustainable and enduring well being as opposed to the immediate well being that might be given uh, or you know, provided by eudynamic pursuits. 
uh, sorry, uh, hedonistic pursuits. And eudynamic interventions achieve well-being uh, by encouraging meaning, authenticity, excellence, and growth. And for eudynamic um, uh, interventions, it's not about ignoring these sort of uncomfortable feelings. It's actually about working through them, understanding them, and finding your connection with them, being able to tolerate them. Um, so really going back to conceptualizing identity, I know I've sort of been jumping around all over the place, but actually it comes back to identity. So we talked about the different sort of um, developmental milestones very briefly, you know, Ericsson's idea of these developmental milestones and how identity can shift and change. And, um, and, and, and you know, we might um, veer more towards this sort of um, self-transcendent identity when we're older and maybe very you know in a, in a different form when we're very young but actually in our teens it would be it's healthy and right that that individualistic side of us is is um watered and flowered and uh, flowers and has the it's time to sort of um grow so now we're looking at this sort of um, again thomas more his um idea he's talking about yoga here but i love what the way he he, he describes um the the, the the connection between body and mind and soul with with the external world so the ensouled body is a communion with the body of the world and finds its health in that intimacy beyond the practice of yoga one might be a perfectionist fantasy or images of um, purity but soul is not about transcendence soul yoga wants more intimacy between consciousness and the soul between our body and the world's body and between ourselves and fellow human beings so it's this kind of um uh, connection between self body um, as well as other people um, and and all of nature and i love that definition and really um in many ways that's vroe's you know mission as well so we're at an inflection point where we, we really must reevaluate old social structures and reimagine what it means to be human. And we really must think about, you know, the influence culture has on this idea of self and that there are there is no one way. You know, this individual autonomous self isn't good or bad, but that isn't the only aspect of us. And actually, we're much broader um, bigger, larger beings and that there is much more to being human and to this being human. So I really like this um, way of conceptualizing identity and the role of humanity on Earth, um, ego, ego, eco, uh, seva, and basically it's talking about the evolution of humankind um, collectively as opposed to individual identities. And really we, we need to consider that, that some of this sort of evolution has been, um, uh, Barbara Marx um, Hubbard talks about this, natural evolution from ego, eco, and see, but this is, this is sort of, we're in the adolescence of um, our collective identity, if you will, and there is a natural transition of us growing and gaining wisdom and perhaps going um, into sort of, uh, we're kind of probably between ego and eco now and perhaps developing into this sort of um, server mindset, which is really about um, just uh, benevolence and kindness and really just connecting with the world and understanding the re reciprocal nature of the world that we live in um, and really functioning from that mindset, really a deep, deep understanding um, of nature and the world around us. So the problem with psychotherapy is that, um, so the issue is that um, at the moment we have demand um, too much demand and not in, enough supply you know so psychotherapy is a one-to-one -one situation where you provide therapy you know for one person small groups or perhaps a couple and actually mental health is on the rise and you know um, drastically on the rise suicide is on the rise um, you know uh, depression is one of the leading um, um, is, is, is really recognized as a leading uh, issue um, and uh, leading cause in disabilities um, within the world and you can imagine how it affects, you know, the world of work and how it affects, um, you know, family life, you know, mental illness. Um, but the issue is with psychotherapy is that we just don't um, have enough psychotherapists and, and the way it works is one to one um, or two to one. And so it, it's quite limited in that way. And so it's a, you know there's a, there's a social and cultural problem and we need to address that as well. Um, so the, the dodo bird affair, uh, verdict is um, Sol Rosenzweig um, came as a result of his work and it basically refers to um, uh, it's written on the, the the dodo told Alice after a race in Wonderland um, 
uh, that we all must have prizes. And basically it's talking about it's psychotherapy is it's sort of everything is um, all psychotherapies and there's almost 600 types of different sort of psych, just psychotherapies alone. Um, all of them are equally, you know, good, basically. Um, so that really suggests that there's not this sort of unique uh, aspect of these therapies and they're, they're all uniquely good. And so that really led, uh, that was, you know, um, a long time ago, I think in the, uh, I think it was in the 60s um, or 30s, so I might get the date wrong, sorry, I think it was in the 60s, um, so Rosen's work, uh, work, but um, he basically suggested that, you know, that, that, that they're all, there's nothing unique. And so that really led um, to uh, researchers, uh, psychologists um, coming on board and saying, OK, let's research this. Is, are they all, is there anything unique about these therapies? And so Carl Rogers, um, who's a person-centered um, therapist, very, very well known um, in therapy and psychology world, um, sort of spearheaded and led the way um, in that work, which you know, looked for the common factors, basically, um, amongst these therapies. And for a long time, you know, they found that there, there are these common factors that kind of thread these therapies together, for example, like the therapeutic relationship. And that, you know, but but they, they, that ultimately, many of these therapies were, you know, th those common factors were why they were successful, for example, the therapeutic relationship. So, so th that was a real issue within, um, you know, the therapeutic and the, the, the applied psychology world, because if the therapies are kind of all the same and they don't have anything unique, then, uh, you know, what's good about them? Um, but of course, there are lots of things that are good about them. But, but um, you know, it was good research to sort of show some of the limitations. And now with problems with pharmacotherapy. So, you know, the placebo effect is well known within um in the world now but in, in therapeutic circles and Irving um, Kirch basically is, is one of the leading um, scientific researchers on the placebo effect I, I recommend you looking into his work and the placebo effect is when improvement of symptoms is observed despite using a non-active treatment so you know you, you just give a sort of dud pill and you do a controlled um, design and you give a dud pill and, um, you know, one control group has a dud pill and then one, one control group has, um, you know, uh, the paracetamol or whatever the medication is. And um, they found that actually this sort of the belief in something working has is very powerful um, that, it you know, this placebo effect was recognized as something that was happening quite a lot. Um, in in uh, uh, psychiatric medication as well as pharmacotherapy, uh, especially in pain, um, particularly in pain research, by the way, I think I should say. So what's the outcome? Well, what seems to be happening is that, yes, we have some great therapies out there, and we're going to talk about some of the third waves of therapy that's come about as a result of um, the dodo bird verdict, as well as the common factors but, um, outcome. Um, but what, what happened was this, we kind of began to realize that we've got partially effective treatments. Um, they kind of, you know, work to some degree, but they're, they're partially effective and mental health is on the rise. And, we, we, you know, we can't treat everyone. And so there's long waiting lists and people aren't getting the help that they deserve and need. And of course, in one meta-analysis, um, psychotherapy and uh, pharmacotherapy yielded small to moderate effect sizes. So again, really just sort of... Um, supporting this statement of partially effective treatments. So the problem, well, we've got, you know, just to round up, so we've got this issue with identity, which is quite limited and the idea of self, but societal shadows, um, which are sort of talking about loneliness and isolation and people feeling disconnected from one another and mistrust and paranoia and people not, you know, due to judgment and being um, worried about sort of, um, you can't really present your true self. And so people feel more and more lonely and isolated and alone. And then you have this drastic rise in mental illness and suicide, which is, again, reflective of who we are, I believe, and, and uh, the, the, this, the undercurrent issues within um, our societies. Zombie nation, again, over-reliance on prescription medication. And of course, um, this is true um, in, in, in many states, uh, Many is a, it's probably a few states in America um, where, you know, this over reliance to, um, to what ultimately was pain medication and led to addiction, um, you know, for, for um, people who, who were suffering. 
Um, and the medical model, well, stigmatization and over reliance on partially effective treatments. Well, the medical model is a model that basically um, uh, has uh, has um, um, been sort of in its early days, particularly the medical model was really looking at again, um, looking at the sort of um, uh, genetic roots and and um, stigmatizing and labeling everything um, and served a purpose you know it's sort of in some ways the charlatans were um, dismissed from or some of the charlatans were dismissed from the arena and it did find a lot of very useful sort of evidence to, to sort of help us understand mental illness but at the same time that stigmatization was a problem and of course as we've talked about this sort of future of uncertainty COVID-19 climate change disparity aging population overpopulation we really need to look at how we treat mental illness and how we understand it and conceptualize it. So the third ways of therapies with Stephen Hayes, acceptance and commitment therapies, Paul Gilbert, um, compassion focused therapies, Marsha Linenhan, um, uh, dialectical behavioral therapy, they all really looked at this common factors idea and really used it to try to create evidence based therapies that look at the common factors of relationships and compassion and acceptance and trying to weave that into therapy. What works was weaved into um, these third waves of therapies. And um, there's a lot of evidence to show their effectiveness and that they are working. So the solution is, um, I'm nearly finished, just a couple of more minutes. Um, so the solution is avoid the egoic self completely. Of course, with all the stresses of society, it, you can see why people do that. You know, why people might just be gaming all the time and porn and, um, you know, um, addiction to um, drugs. And of course, this wonderful quote um, from Oscar Wilde um, about the, the, the book, The Picture of uh, uh, Dorian Gray, there were opium dens where one could um, by oblivion, dens of horror where the memory of old sins could be destroyed by the madness of the sins that were new. And I think that's such a poignant and powerful quote in terms of how people need to escape the ego and the cultural pressures that are placed on them. And of course, another solution is escaping the ego itself through meditation, through what we call healthier forms of escapism. Some may argue against that meditation is escaping the self, but I would say that in some, it depends on the type of meditation, but it is um, in some ways about leaving the ego itself. Um, so, um, you know, reading, surfing, all of that stuff. So the solution really, we need to come up with treatments and interventions that look at adaptation, ingenuity and change, uh, something new and novel. We can't, the old ways aren't working. And the third ways of the therapies in psychotherapy and uh, applied psychology are helping with that sort of shift towards um, new and novel ideas. Inclusion, connection, nurture and equality. We really need to think about these ideas and David Sloan Wilson really talks about, you know, uh, the, the basis of being human. And actually, you know, yes, Darwinian um, evolutionary perspective is valid, but actually there's more to this being human and cooperation um, and connection um, and, and this sort of um, we mindset is much more important to our survival um, than we once thought. Balance and cohesion, well, um, ment mental illness is ultimately about dysregulation of the nervous system. Um, and Stephen Porge, um, Porge is, um, uh, talks about this. So really trying to find interventions that look at balancing um, and finding, helping us find um, balance and calm and cohesion within our internal worlds. And, reached, and to treatments that look at regenerating, recalibrating and reinvigorating as opposed to blunting affect, as opposed to, um, you know, numbing us, um, I think is necessary. Now, I must say I'm not against um, psychiatric medication. I've worked in inpatient units where, you know, people who are experiencing acute onset, for example, of, um, you know, symptoms of schizophrenia, they have found some solace in psychiatric medication, but it should, I think it shouldn't be the first resort. I think we need to have other options on the table. And I think um, it, it, it should be more of a supportive, um, play a supportive role within mental illness. So the so solution, self-transcendence, and after the break, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about why I think self-transcendence is a solution. Thank you so much. Sorry about, um, took a bit longer. So, hi everyone, thanks for coming back. And so we're going to talk about now self-transcendence and why, um, 
how it's linked to the overview effect and why I think it's relevant to mental health and how some are already, um, you know, uh, trialing and testing self-transcendent interventions, for example, with psychedelics. So when we think about, excuse me, when we think about self-transcendence, often these kinds of thoughts and images might come to mind and these made me giggle a little bit um, in terms of, you know, psychedelics and self-transcendence coming back to work after a psychedelic weekend. And you've got, you know, yellow bird there um, walking behind our fader and, uh, uh, you know, the matrix and, you know, thinking about self-transcendence as this sort of um, power trip almost where we can kind of, you know, um, change things and uh, move planets and stars. And, you know, um, and that, really, that's just to show you that's not what I mean by it. <laughs> So what is self-transcendence? Well, it's quite a complex area and we're still really developing um, our understanding of what it is. And, uh, you know, people like David Yadin um, have done wonderful work in trying to, um, amongst many others, have done wonderful work in trying to sort of understand what it really is. And people are working on scales and um, psychological measures. The self-transcendence ultimately involves the experience of um, a pers uh, expansion of personal boundaries to encompass that which is greater than the self. Um, and this might include, include the universe or spiritual you know, concepts. Um, and so connecting beyond what's you out to the universe and the cosmos. And again, that's Kloninger um, definition. Um, so types, so it's important to recognize that there's different types of self-transcendence. And when we talk about self-transcendence self to people, often they think, gosh, you know, you completely, the, the ego dissolves completely, you're completely, you know, disconnected and you completely sort of fly off and, um, you know, uh, have these sort of outer body experiences. And it doesn't necessarily have to mean that. There are different types of self-transcendence. And one person, Kuhl, in 2005, tried to show us these sort of through research and um, a model um, uh, different types of self-transcendence and so you have ego transcendence which is you know we talk very briefly about the ego um, but uh, talking about sort of leaving the ego leaving this idea of self the, the, the ego which sort of mediates between the id and the super ego and just transcending that transcending the ego beyond to explore what's beyond that then we have self-transcendence, so which is beyond the self to the other. And again, this touches on Cloninger's ideas of personality a little bit. Um, but, you know, sort of beyond the self to connect with other people and the world and understanding the world as this interconnected kind of system. Then you have this sort of deeper level of transcendence, which is a spiritual transcendence, where you transcend beyond space and time. You know, these outer body experiences might be these types of spiritual transcendence. Um, an experience which falls under that category. So it's important just to recognize that as well in terms of um, when, when we're trying to create self-transcendent interventions or when we're trying to administer them. Um, so self-transcendent experience, well, what types of experiences can um, promote or prime us potentially for self-transcendence? By the way, these experiences don't necessarily um, lead to self-transcendence, but, you know, they can do. And of course, as we know, meditation, I've got some sort of um, suggestions for research to follow up. But meditation um, can sort of um, help us sort of transcend the self or um, you know, lead to tr uh, spiritual transcendence. Psychedelics, you know, uh, is, is known to, to support self-transcendence. Um, and um, extreme sports, you know, for, for some people who participate regularly in extreme sports, they often talk about this flow or they talk about this flow states or they talk about self-transcendence, you know, connecting with something beyond the self. But actually, interestingly, self-transcendence can also be triggered by asphy asphyxiation um, and self-harm. Um, so it's important to know the sort of, um, and I'm, I'm still understanding and beginning to understand this myself, the sort of mechanisms and the um, biological basis as well for different types of self-transcendence. Because, you know, one of the key uh, factors for self-harm for some people is that it can help them transcend the self, you know, when they cut themselves or when they you know, might, um, uh, you know, um, asphyxiate themselves. They, 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 it helps them transcend the self momentarily, leave their body. And they have these highs, as, as for some, um, afterwards. And again, there's research to support this. So it's important just to understand the different types of um, 
experiences, positive and negative, that can lead to self-transcendence. So the level of intensity, so just some summaries, the level in, uh, of intensity and the extent of ego modification or unification varies amongst people. Um, and personal mitigating factors must also be considered. So, you know, for example, like Ericsson's developmental milestones, what, you know, at what age of development is this person? Um, and as well as personality factors, uh, self-directedness um, and um, resilience and flexibility and openness to experiences. You know, th these things need to be, I think, considered at least, at the very least, um, of course, alongside set and setting and all of these things. So self-transcendence can occur instantaneously or gradually and exists on a continuum positive and negative so positive aspects of self like many experiences but positive aspects of self-transcendence are euphoria sense of freedom maybe even some aspects of awe um, or that awe is laced with fear but this sense of unification might be experienced positively then the negative or the other sort of opposite end of the um, continuum might be um, uncomfortable dissociation, derealization, depersonalization, which are all different types of dissociation, um, um, and, and, and fear. Now, these things don't necessarily have to be negative or bad. For some people, they work through it, and that's part of the self-transcendent experience. But if you don't have that resilience or you, you're not familiar with you know, what happens, then it, it can feel quite frightening. So self-salience, again, um, the, uh, you know, importance of self versus the collective in social relationships can affect mental health. So self salience is a, it's, it's a common um, aspect to self, uh, self transcendence, you know, um, the reduction uh, of self salience. But actually, um, that also then looks at if we are not feeling like our autonomous self exists, and we're connecting to the universe completely, then, and, and it's, it's not sort of momentarily, it's, it's a constant sort of deep sort of um, connection um, where we lose the self entirely. Well, how does that sort of um, materialize with how we um, see problems and attribute sort of blame and how we sort of consider, um, how we reason um, what, what um, you know, um, what the issues are. I don't know if I didn't explain that part very well, but uh, I think you get the gist. And then personality and temperament. Um, so, you know, what kind of personality does one have and um, so sort of how can it mitigate the positive and negative um, aspects of self-transcendence? So what are the benefits and application of self-transcendent interventions in mental health? Well, there's already a lot of work being done. And over the years, you know, um, in the 60s, 50s and 60s, you know, people like um, Stanislav Grof, um, you know, uh, amongst others, um, uh, were, you know, working on psychedelic uh, assisted psychotherapy and they conducted clinical trials, but um, there were some methodological flaws back then. So the trials were stopped and there were sort of some um, uh, worries around the risks of people taking psychedelics, um, you know, um, recreationally. And so, you know, that was all stopped. But from the 90s onwards, psychedelic trials have started again and slowly slowly more and more evidence have built uh, has built and robin carhart harris um who um was at imperial he recently i think is moving um to america um and we have um others as well um griffiths and nichols um who are really paving the way and they're just a few names there um in in psychedelic assisted psychotherapy nature-based therapies and green interventions are there's more and more evidence um developing for them as well um and you know in there have been some trials um in in in, in uh, some i think uh, states in america and then in the uk as well meditation mindfulness ma based uh, meditation again has um has um grown in popularity and the research is beginning to there is a lot of research actually around that um so we can see and then there's digital multi-sensory therapies which is um again virtual reality the research for that has been growing for since at least um I think even the 70s, 80s, but definitely the 90s. Um, and in terms of for exposure therapy, virtual reality is, is commonplace almost now and is very effective and um, uh, in, in treating um, anxiety disorders. But in terms of self-transcendent therapies, 
beginning to sort of um, uh, multi-sensory therapies and digital therapies are beginning to explore it as well. So just a little bit of research on one form of self-transcendent intervention, which is psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. Well, there's so much research beginning to sort of um, come out um, um, and MDMA for the treatment of alcoholism, for example, and post-traumatic stress disorder has been shown to be very effective. And, um, you know, um, there are um, some of the restrictions, the legal restrictions are beginning to be lifted. And so we're, we're likely to see this coming together of the psycho uh, pharmaceutical sort of companies potentially with some some of the um, uh, psychedelic kind of therapies or potentially they might go go it alone but it will become more mainstream I think this has been predicted by many people um, and so um, again psilocybin for the treatment of um, psychological distress associated with existential dread so near near death um, sorry uh, end of life care palliative care um, you know cancer um, patients people who've been diagnosed with cancer that have uh, you know a prognosis that they don't have long to live uh, the psycho uh, uh, psilocybin and again on a broader sort of uh, area self transcendent treatments can be very helpful and beneficial um, and I won't read the rest, but you can see that it's just beginning this sort of evidence is collected, being has been built over the years since the 90s to support um, specific types of treatment um, for psychedelic, psychedelics, treating specific, specific types of mental health issues. So now the overview effect. Well, what's the link, you know, between the overview effect and self-transcendence? Well, this is Frank's um, definition of the overview effect, which has been a very important um, basis to build upon and his work as you know um, has led to so much insight into this area and into this phenomenon and um, people have followed since in trying to add on to um, his work or to um, uh, you know uh, extend it but actually from a psychological perspective and adding on to Frank's work I sort of I've taken Frank's definition and thought, well, OK, what does that mean? What are the psych psychological constructs? And actually, the overview effect really neatly does fall under this sort of umbrella of a self-transcendent experience. So the overview effect can just, so I'm going to sort of reform the definition slightly. And again, David Yadin, Frank and others have um, done this too occasionally. So the overview effect describes the psychological effects of viewing natural landscape from an expansive vantage point. And seeing Earth from orbit or the moon is the epitome of this experience. The experience is marked by decreased self salience and increased feelings of connectedness, and often leads to a more conscious and caring view of our planet and life on it. So you can see that actually, once you sort of combine self transcendent definition of self transcendence with you, it actually works um, and complements Frank's um, initial. Uh, original definition very well. Here are some quotes from some astronauts um, who I actually interviewed as part of my doctorate, um, which um, I completed in 2016. Just gives you an idea of, you know, how impactful it is for some astronauts. I would go as far as to say for many astronauts, there are the um, you know, outliers, um, there are some astronauts that, um, you know, don't proclaim, they see the perceptual kind of interconnectedness of the world and the beauty of the earth, they comment on that, but perhaps they don't have that sort of a deeper spiritual um, awakening. However, as we saw earlier, the, the, you know, there, there are variations in self-transcendence and different types and forms of it can manifest. So um, we'll come back to that. But here are some um, um, quotes from astronauts. I'll read one of them and the, Joseph Allen, who's a wonderful, wonderful retired NASA astronaut, and a physicist, he said that every cosmonaut and every astronaut I've known, without exception, every one of them cannot get over the beauty of seeing planet Earth. It just takes your breath away. And he was having wonderful um, experience that he told me. He, he has reoccurring dreams of planet Earth, um, which reminds me of um, Carl Jung, who had a near-death experience, who also um, had uh, a vision of leaving the body and going out into space and or orbit and seeing planet Earth. But Joseph Allen, up until now, has reoccurring dreams. Well, up until I spoke with him for the interview, had reoccurring dreams of planet Earth. Just sort of shows how um, completely awe-inspiring the experience can be or is. So 
Um, so really looking at my research, well, interactions and a sense of connectedness with nature are considered important contributors to human health and well-being. We already know that. There's lots of research to show a meaningful connection with nature is essential for well-being. And so, of course, earth gazing is just another way of engaging with nature. It's another form of interacting with um, nature. Um, and so really, if we look at it from that sort of perspective, we can begin to think, OK, well, this is sort of a different type or way of uh, engaging and interacting with nature. Let's research it. So really, it's an atypical method, earth gazing, of, of uh, an atypical method of engaging with nature. And so the research suggests, um, so there is some evidence to say that uh, space and space-like environments have got salutogenic benefits. So there's sort of um, the positive long-term psychological benefits of these types of missions. Yes, we know that they also have um, some very, you know, extreme environments like that can take their toll on the body and, and the mind. I'm not denying that at all. I'm not saying it's all positive and but there are some salutogenic effects and benefits of space flight. And really, I suppose my research has really focused on that. And the overview effect really taps into that, that sort of perspective shift it offers, that self transcendent it of transcendence it offers to some people um, is, is, can be a positive experience. So there is um, anecdotal and preliminary studies that suggest that earth gazing can strengthen our connection to nature, elicit or gratitude, humility and reverence. And my research, um, I, I'll tell you a bit more about my research, but in, I interviewed seven NASA astronauts um, and did an IPA qualitative study, um, showed the same thing. So these features really suggest that it can be um, important for applied psychology, right? Because if if um, the 600 people that have gone to space uh, to date, or almost, sorry, um, have gone to um, orbit um, uh, or moon or landed on the moon, and out of these, many or most, um, I would go as far as to say, have um, had these experiences of awe and gratitude and humility, these types of positive, transformative emotions. Um, and and they you know, have a stronger connection with nature to, to varying degrees when they come back. And it influences their behavior to at least promote them to do, you know, uh, to, to reflect on or to act on these inclinations to sort of um, be more kind to the environment. Then surely that's worthwhile us exploring and looking at and thinking about where it fits in into mental health and psychology. So my research, again, although research has provided convincing evidence that nature is therapeutic, there's limited research exploring the impact of extraordinary and profound natural environments. And of course, profound natural environments we know now are, um, you know, can. So we know now that the environment has just this sort of almost I mean, we don't know this for a fact, but, you know, the nature nurture debate has been going on for years and nature was leading the way for many years. And now we're kind of at a place where we're thinking what's well, it's sort of nature and nurture equally and in different um, depending on the context, nature is more important at times and nurture at other times and, and most of the time equally important. So profound environments and experiences can have effect on us. And we know that through trauma work, for example, um, uh, and, you know, that, that profound, difficult uh, experiences can, can have um, play havoc on our internal world. But what about if we switch that over and sort of go to the opposite end? What about profound or inducing experiences um, and self-transcendence? How can they impact our internal world? You know, what, what's the effect on us? Um, that way. So anyway, my research was, as I said, I interviewed seven NASA astronauts um, and uh, did a qualitative IPA study. I didn't couldn't get more participants, so that limited me to do a qualitative study, although, sorry, limited is not sort of the right word. And um, the, the study was important to do a qualitative study because there wasn't much research out there. So we really need to sort of develop the theory and the hypothesis and then maybe do mixed designs or qualitative uh, and quantitative studies later on, and interview seven retired NASA astronauts. So there was lots of themes, as Frank highlighted earlier on, that really sort of supported Frank's work. You know, yes, we found that people experience or yes, um, positive emotions. Yes, um, the, the, the borders and boundaries, um, you know, just dispersed almost. You know, they became citizens of the world and the universe for some. Um, 
so all of those things stood true. But actually, I was really uh, towards the end of my recession and afterwards been really uh, interested in what have been the mechanisms of change. What has um, been the psychological um, constructs or mechanisms that's contributed to the shifts happening within the astronauts. And one of the main things that came up was cognitive dissonance. Of course, when you have this extreme perspective shift where you you live, leave the environment that you are normally connected to and you normally kind of don't have the self-awareness that, oh yeah, I'm, I'm, as Frank was saying, I'm on a planet sailing through the universe. You're kind of a part of the environment, it's just like our cells, they don't really, you know, within our body, they don't think, oh yeah, I'm a cell, you know, and we don't really have that. We might sort of conceptually understand it or in theory, but we really don't understand it. But actually when you have that perspective shift and you actually leave the womb, as it were, and uh, Frank talked about that, leaving the womb, leaving the body of the earth and disconnecting from it, escaping from it. Um, uh, then you see um, things perceptually and conceptually uh, understand them. I think um, that is profound, but it can also lead to cognitive dissonance, which is this sort of you have your existing beliefs, but then now you're being fed new um beliefs through this new perspective. So new beliefs are being formed through this new perspective. And there's a conflict between your existing pre-held beliefs and these sort of wow beliefs that are coming in. And so then there's tension. And actually that tension is sometimes what creates or often is what can create the shift, that uncomfortableness that we can't sit with the tension that can create the shift. So cognitive dissonance is very important in behavior change and sometimes in therapy. You know, that can be created, um, uh, that scenario. So balance between stress and um, satiation. So basically another important part of the experience is, again, that kind of sweet spot between satiation and stress. It's really important and finding that in therapy, we call it sometimes a window of tolerance in therapy, um, is a really important part of the experience that astronauts have. And, um, you know, trying to sort of um, find that sweet spot is important in therapy, too. Um, and so positive emotions and the endocrine, endocrine system. Well, if you think about sort of dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin and all of these types of um, uh, chemicals that are released in the body, positive emotions uh, and, and um, the endocrine system play, um, uh, you know, very um, uh, in sort of uh, the... The, the, the very, they rely on each other. So um, the astronauts ha have these sort of transforming emotions of awe, positive emotions of gratitude, um, you know, reverence. And so what kind of, how does that affect our internal world, you know, and, and uh, the, the chemicals that are released and, and, you know. So if we can recreate even just parts of that experience, can we then, for some people, can it sort of help, you know, can we be an alchemist of the internal world in a sense. And again, eudynamic well-being. So touches on eudynamic well-being because many of, or some or most of the astronauts are talking about leading more virtuous lives, you know, sort of in terms of wanting to be more environmentally friendly and to do sort of right by, by the environment and more eco-consciousness, if you will. Um, and stress reduction, I'm not going to go into it too much, but um, there are theories in eco-psychology that talk about attention restoration theory and stress reduction theory, where um, nature can reduce um, our emotional load, stress, um, and cognitive stress. So um, the astronauts talked about earth gazing, you know, was was an enjoyment, enjoying activity. Um, uh, they enjoyed the activity of earth gazing, but it also helped reduce some stress for them. Um, so less than 600 people have, ha have actually had the opportunity to encounter a drastically different perspective of life, nature and the planet and, co and the cosmos. What if we could harness and recreate some of the positive psychological effects of the overview effect via um, positive technologies like virtual reality with the view of testing it as a type of self-transcendent therapy for certain groups and people? And that's where VROE came in. And once I finished my doctorate, I set up um, VROE. Uh, we're an ethical um, company. Uh, we're still in the sort of early days of formation. However, um, we set up VROE as a means to do this, to try to recreate aspects of the overview effect using my initial research and um, 
uh, other people uh, before me, their, their research, um, and to create this multi-sensory um, experiences. Um, uh, you can read it via the create multi-sensory evidence-based tech solutions centered on the overview effect. Our meditative journeys aim to regenerate, reconnect, recalibrate, and reinvigorate. Now, it's early days. We're hoping to have um, evidence-based or evidence-led programs. Um, we're hoping to have um, many of these programs, which uh, we will develop over the years. At the moment, we have a couple of pilots, and you're going to experience a 2D version of pilot today at the end of um, at the end of um, my talk. Um, and so, the elements that make up VROE well: there's virtual reality. There's going to be celestial content. Earth will always be the key grounding principle of that content. So you will always come back to Earth, or Earth will be in view some way, or you know, you will journey out and come back in and see Earth. Um, biofeedback and music. This um, pilot doesn't have biofeedback. It does have haptics, but you, you will hear music. And it, it's not just any music. We've used science behind music. So there's, there's got, a lot of thought has gone into creating the pieces that we've created. Um, and the science of music is used, and we, we, we refer to people who are composers and understand the science of music um, to create um, uh, our programs. Meditation, well, there's guided meditation often within the programs. Um, and again, there's expertise, my own and other people's, where you know we, we create really uh, thoughtful meditations, and we're not afraid of criticism. So we, you know, the pilots, that's what they're there for, so that people can give our, us uh, constructive feedback, and so then we can use that feedback to try to create something even more meaningful. And workshops, well, there needs to be a way of integrating the, all of this. So um, the workshops are part of that, and. Um, uh, we we'll you know, provide them once a year, twice a year. At the moment, we're not providing them, if I'm honest, but we will be providing them next year. And uh, we have also, as I said, eight week ecotherapy, which all of this is sort of coming off the back of the VR to help integrate the virtual reality experience. But also the, the VR on its own is just um, a head on, almost a hedonic um, experience. But, you know, we need that integration and we need the other aspects and elements of it to sort of make it into a mental health intervention. So I'm not going to go into this because we haven't got time, but this is the science of the music. So we use Schumann, Schumann resonance um, for the base, base of the sort of uh, music. You can't really hear that, but it is there. Um, we use binaural beats and you will need your headphones when you uh, listen to the um, pilot that you're going to listen to in 2D form later on. Um, and there's a whole sort of, and, and it's called Music of the Spheres. Um, and really, um, we've looked at human brain waves and trying to align the frequencies and the music between the alpha and theta brain waves. And again, I haven't got too much time to go into that, but you can look into it later. I'm sorry to have to rush through. Again, the 360 VR footage, um, we've used models of Earth that are based on uh, NASA Blue Marble data set. Um, and, you know, this is just one, for example, one image of out of um, roughly 30, 36,000 images, which goes to make up the, it says 20 minutes, but it's actually 25 minute video. So what, you know, where did all this idea come from? Well, VROE is built on several models and pre-existing theories, psychological theories. And one of them is this social psychological model of learning from Bandura, the social learning theory. Um, really, just to sort of simplify it, it's about vicarious learning, learning through observation and learning, um, you know, through how our brain is malleable and changes and how observing and interacting with the external world and other people shapes who we are. And um, Bandura, to sort of support his model and hypothesis, conducted the Bobo doll experiments um, this was back in the 60s, um, which is completely unethical now, I think, to do things, something like this. But Bobo doll experiments, basically an adult would go and um, sort of act nicely and warmly and compassionately to Bodo, Bodo, uh, Bodo doll and then would, would be aggressive, basically, as you can see in some of those images, you know, hitting and punching the Bodo doll, uh, Bodo doll and then Bobo doll. And then the child would observe. And then what, what they noticed is the child responded exactly the same way, almost mimicking the adult's behavior. Um, so that was called the Bobo doll experiment. So really the basis of VROE is based on that learning hypothesis that you know we rely on that interaction with the external world and that nature and nurture play an important part in informing us and uh, changing us. 
So also, you know, David's, um, so David Wilson talks about the evolutionary model and this idea of cooperation, connection and, and adaptation um, really forming the basis of, sorry, supporting our survival and um, ensuring our survival. Um, so this is um, a sort of relatively recent sort of idea um, uh, that, you know, connection and cooperation are essential to our survival. Um, so it slightly goes against, I suppose, Darwin, some of Darwin's ideas. Um, but I, I think in, in my sort of naive opinion, both can be true um, and, uh, and, and both have a uh, basis. Um, and again, so another sort of area that really helped form this uh, VROE is quantum field model theory. And again, one of my favorite um, quantum physicists um, is David Bohm, who really talked about sort of uh, explicit and implicit order and talked about, you know, everything isn't separate and disconnected. We are actually part of a field, um, uh, a wave, if you like, and everything is interrelated and interconnected and interdependent part, uh, uh, part of that. So nothing is separate. Um, again, I'm not going to go too much into that, but maybe another time I can tell you a bit more about sort of how, how the idea developed. But neuropsychological model, again, so um, mirror neurons and um, neuroplasticity. So really thinking about how malleable our brains are, of course, dependent on age and developmental milestones. So when we're younger, much more malleable brains. But but in, in, in how we can actually, um, we already are being shaped and influenced by the outside world all the time. How can we tap into that to do it in a really thoughtful way to support our mental health, resilience, our flexibility? Um, and so, you know, again, mirror neurons, um, some research on that too. Um, the, the research on the empathy side is sort of a little bit um, up and down with mirror, mirror neurons, but mirror neurons basically talking about um, how we, similar to what um, Bandura was talking about in social learning theory, is how our internal world changes based on our observation and how we imitate what we see and how that shapes and changes our neural um, world, if you like, or brain. So, and then we have polyvagal theory, Stephen Porges, and eco-psychology, existential therapy, or EMDR, somatic experiencing, all of these things, sensor, sensory motor psychotherapy, all of these uh, therapies, existing therapies have heavily um, influenced the work of VROE and what we're trying to achieve, multi-sensory experiences that help regulate your internal world and help teach you the art of self-regulation. Um, and so, again, neuropsychology, well, I'm not going to go into this too much, but basically we're constantly, we are um, constantly assessing for threat. You know, that's one of the primary roles of our brains is to sort of scan the world and to say, is that a threat? Is that a threat? Yes, no, yes, no. And so categorizes, um, um, you know, the, the, what, what our senses feed back to it um, in this way and then forms sort of these uh, models um, around it. So um, again, um, uh, Mark Solms, um, he um, talks about seven instinctual systems of survival and reproduction of the brain. And this is really fascinating area, which um, I'm beginning to sort of learn more and more about over the years. And he talks about these instinctive, instinctual systems in the brain, like they, they have their own sort of pathways almost in the brain. So he talks about the neuropsychology and the neuroscience of it and the drives of wanting, liking, fear, rage, attachment, care and nurturance and play and how, you know, linking these to actual neural pathways in the brain, such a fascinating area. And uh, please do check um, those references out and um, that the, the, his work out. And basically, um, so with, I suppose, with what we're doing, we're really tapping into the wanting system, uh, which is uh, the exploration system, the system which is looking out to seek new experiences, um, uh, the dopamine system, basically, that's uh, what activates dopamine. Um, so uh, so that's sort of something that we're, we are looking into um, in, in terms of what we're doing. And it's also a system you have to really step with caution with because, you know, that's why some people get addicted to danger, for example. And dopamine, of course, is um, 
you know, a very um, inherent part of addiction, you know, that dopamine re release um, uh, alongside other chemicals and uh, neurotransmitters. So um, the other part we're focusing on uh, is the caring system, which um, again was one of those pathways um, that has been identified um, within the brain. And so uh, Professor um, Paul Gilbert talks about this in his compassion focused therapy, which is very much based on neuropsychology um, in terms of the caring system um, and how uh, sometimes the caring system is underdeveloped within some people, especially if um, uh, you know trauma has adversely affected them. And so how can we, if the caring, can the caring system be um, uh, supported? Um, and how can we teach people the skills to practice so that they can develop their caring system, both within the brain, but both, both socially and, you know, um, psychologically and um, uh, all of that sort of all of those elements as well. So the soothing system, the caring system is another area within um, within VROE that we're looking at trying to create, you know, compassion. Um, if you think about compassion and loving kindness and those kinds of um, states and emotions and const constructs. So some of the potential benefits. Well, we're, we're still in the early days. We're, we're just beginning the testing sort of phase. We're doing some testing with non-vulnerable groups. And we've got some um, uh, we've got some research partnerships with um, some universities uh, sort of in the pipeline and some uh, citizen science projects in the pipeline. But what so what are the benefits? Well, we think the overview effect, as we talked about, can help lower stress. And we're talking about um, eco -psycho psychological concepts of stress so that this sort of type of engagement meaningful engagement with nature can help reduce emotional and cognitive stress we think that the overview effect if we can recreate it successfully the phenomena or aspects of or some of those psychological constructs within the phenomena we, we believe that it can strengthen connectedness to nature promote a sense of meaning and belonging and perhaps you know help elicit these sort of um constructs and emotions like all gratitude and uh, we think biofeedback well we know biofeedback is effective we think it's part of our programs that we could help reduce sympathetic arousal or help regulate um you know this uh, the sympathetic nervous system um and actually um the autonomic nervous system because some people with dissociation might need to step out of the autonomic um the system which is about diso relaxation and calmness but also about dissociation um and um so sonic beats and haptic feedback uh, well you know and binaural beats and so lower music again there's a lot of science developing around music and how it can lower stress uh, certain types of music can um, increase relaxation and improve sleep sleep elicit all compassion and gratitude through music promote creativity of course there is some subjectivity with all this but we're going to test and try to see if we can find a common thread. Meditation, lower stress. We know there's, again, lots of med um, research on this. You can just Google it on Google Scholar and things will come up. Increased relaxation, improved sleep, so on and so forth. So these, that's what we're trying to do. OK, uh, five minutes, hopefully, and I'll run through it. To help people reconnect with self, what are we trying to do? What's our mission? Well, we're trying to help people reconnect with self through self-regulation, through understanding the self, all of these things that we'll be doing through meditation and breathing work, and breath work and grounding exercises through our programs, but also to help connect with others and the world and to understand that, that, that the perspective shift, you know, to understand that we are part of a bigger picture. We are part of this earth, planet earth sailing across the universe and we are um, made of stardust and we belong to the universe and that we are more than we understand. And we're hoping that that gives them more meaning and purpose. So we want to bring interventions that place emphasis, as I said, on regeneration, reconnection, recalibration and reinvigoration to mainstream therapy and to design evidence based interventions that promote individual societal and planetary well-being. And it's early days. I have to keep stressing, you know, these are our mission, our hopes, you know, for our, the future. And the goal as well to provide empirical route to test theories and to study psychological constructs to demonstrate that a compassionate connection to self and the world is a stronger indicator of subjective well-being, um, uh, life satisfaction, um, you know, uh, emotion, positive emotions, resilience and flexibility. 
and to demonstrate the efficacy and effectiveness of multi-sensory self-transcendent technologies alongside the work of other people like Robin Carhart Harris um, uh, and uh, others like him. So reflections, imagine if we could help people see the beauty, the connections and the patterns in life. And if we could help them realize that the grand scheme of things, they do matter. There is a purpose. There is some pattern to this all. And ask yourselves, what would the world be like if people battling with terminal illness, trauma, stress or depression had access to a range of evidence based self transcendent uh, treatments, inclusive of nature, uh, music and mindfulness based therapies, as well as VR assisted and psychedelic assisted therapies where they have different intensities and Imagine what death, the process of death and dying uh, would be like. And of course, um, shamanic traditions and um, shamans, you know, guide people through death. It doesn't have to be, the, you know, the way we're looking at death and dying doesn't have to be that way. We, we can change things and we can shift things. And I'm passionate about particularly palliative care and prison, um, prison care, re reformation and um, rehabilitation you know, to move away from punishment and towards rehabilitation. And that's my hope is one day that these types of evidence based interventions can um, be also introduced to prisons, which there is some work again being done on that. Frank and Anahita, have you got any sort of like final words you'd like to sort of say before we before we end here? We're not going to have time for any questions because we've got to get, give people some time for lunch before the next lecture, you know? Um, hopefully we can have some questions. Um, as you said, so there might be a podcast that we might be doing. So we, we can hopefully catch up with the questions or email me the questions that you have and I'll try to get through them. So please do get in touch if you have any questions. Thank you. Yeah, thanks everybody. Be happy to try to answer your questions at wh whatever point we can. And thank you for coming today and learning more about the overview effect and self-transcendence and all the therapies that Anahita is working on. It was great to be with you. Fantastic. Right. Well, I'm going to end the session now, guys. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, thank you very much, Frank. I'm amazed you're still awake. You're. Uh... <laughs> I'm yeah, going to have breakfast, not lunch. <laughs> um, so, yeah, thanks so much. And I'll see you guys at one o'clock for our next talk from David Stone Wilson. All right. Thank you so much. Bye.